watching online, join us in this anointed moment. Oh my life, you have been so, so year is grow is grow slide number one that looks like two to me everyone say grow don't you never say you have to grow the thing is that if you don't grow you have to go if you don't grow you have to go that's true in everything you employ people uh, they work for you they start off very well then they get used to a paycheck they get used to a boss they become familiar with you and your surroundings and they stop growing. The reason you employ them in the first place is because they have an aptitude and attitude to grow. But the minute they stop growing, they have to go. If you don't grow, you have to go. Say that. The Bible is very clear and Jesus grew in wisdom, in stature, in wisdom, with, in favor with God and with man. And if Jesus, who was God, had to grow, you have to grow. Say, I have to grow. I have to grow. Amen. You have to grow in wisdom, in stature, and in favor. The message today is entitled, Not Ashamed. Say, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. <clears throat> Genesis chapter number 2 and verse 24. <clears throat> Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. Not a woman, a man. Shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and the woman, and were not ashamed. The word naked does not infer just to having no clothes. The word naked there is also, they were totally transparent. They were totally, totally transparent. The man and woman were both naked and were not ashamed. Let's go to slide number three. One of Satan's most successful tools is to build and use shame against a person. The font is a bit small there. Is to use shame against a person. And the uh, identical twin to shame is guilt. I've met people that did something wrong 20, 30 years ago and they still burdened under a load of shame and guilt. Amen. Once you become a Christian and once you're saved, once you've confessed your faults one to another, once you've confessed your sins to God, there is no reason at all for you to carry any shame. The Lord Jesus Christ died on a cross. He was totally naked. They stripped him naked. Every woman, every man, every child, every person passing by, every soldier saw him totally naked. But before he was naked on the cross, in chapter 13 of John, he made himself naked to his disciples. Chapter 13 of the book of John says that when supper was ended, 
he took off his garments and laid them aside. In other words, before the world sees me naked, you have to see me naked. Before I'm transparent to my church, to my constituency, to my people, I have to be transparent to my household. It would be a shame for the disciples to see Jesus naked at the same time everybody else. And the fact that he was naked in the manner he was, the shame of his mother seeing her adult son totally naked, his mother's sister Mary there, and Mary Magdalene there. And all the women, the Bible says in Luke, that traveled with him all saw him naked. They had only seen him in his wisdom, in his might, in his strength, in his miracle power, in his revelation knowledge. This is one thing they had never seen him in his nakedness. And if you are going to be a complete person, a complete savior, a complete problem solver, the person that you are assisting has to know and at least have a sense of your failures, your vulnerabilities, the times when your weakness uh, overtook you and you succumbed. So that the person who is looking at you as a God will know if my idol has erred and made mistakes, if I do, it's not so bad because they failed and yet they are successful. And so it's important for us to walk uprightly before the Lord, but remember, regardless of what you have done in your life, never carry shame, never carry guilt. Have remorse for what you have done. Uh, don't walk around haughty and prideful. And so uh, you must be remorseful. Synonyms of the word shame are humiliation, loss of face, embarrassment, discomposure, guilt, uh, contrition, compunction. Slide number four. Satan will torment a person with shame and guilt for something they did or didn't do in, and hammer that person and hammer that person and hammer that person. If mom will excuse me for using her as a reference, <clears throat> we celebrated uh, Bernstein's birthday at lunch, just five of us. Uh, at our home in Rua, it was mom, uh, Jason, Tadiwa, Cheech, and myself. Just a simple meal of what Bernstein liked to eat, and mom began to rehearse the week and the day when he passed. And she was saying, as she said times before, if only I had done this, if only we had given him this injection, if only we had, if only. And so what happens is that rehearsing an incident and a story is fine, but don't allow that story to hammer you and cause you to have regret and shame and guilt. We have a family here whose child died and swallowed a, a plum pip, and they didn't have money, enough money, at one of the hospitals for the, the child to be attended to. They had to find $5,000 for the child who was dying to be attended to, and they lost their child. And still, they are carrying heavy guilt and shame. There is no reason for you to be guilty. There is no reason for you to carry shame. Say after me, if you are willing and able, I am free from shame. Shame impedes a person's performance and changes their behavior to be docile, secluded, isolated, introverted, and even shy. Satan will accuse you, threaten to expose you publicly for your wrongdoing. And so you just have to say, see, I saw, if I'm exposed, it's fine. Life will go on. The sun won't rise in the north, it won't set in the south. The sun's going to rise in the east and set in the west. It's raining somewhere, it's windy somewhere, there's tragedy somewhere, there's prosperity somewhere. So see, I saw, I'm not going to live the rest of my adult life in shame and in guilt. At the age of 66, in a few days, Imagine living my next two decades, decades carrying shame and guilt. I'm not doing that. I'm going to be happy. Uh, Chichi and I are going to enjoy our lives. We're going to do the very, very best to present for our lives high quality. People that have been sexually abused and molested a lot of times carry shame. And a lot of times, you know, uh, 
there, there are programs that mom watches, especially crime, Chicago PD and all of that stuff. And some of the, the storylines uh, where a woman is raped or molested and they don't tell because a lot of times the woman uh, is said to be the one that enticed the man and the woman is the one on the stand that is abused and belittled. And if you have been molested, if you have been, and if you are being molested, if you know of young girls, young boys, uh, teenagers and so on being sexually molested uh, in the United States, if you have that knowledge and you don't disclose it, it is a crime. You get the same sentence as the person when discovered and convicted, you get the same sentence as they do. I'm not so sure if the law in Zimbabwe goes that far. The thing is that when somebody, especially a woman, and I've seen boys that have been molested and have changed their lives, they walk in their lives with total shame and total guilt. Cheech and I were preaching in Newark, New Jersey. One of our good friends, Katrina Sumner, brought a young man that uh, she brought from the street. And uh, that ministry with uh, Bill Wilson feed on a daily basis anywhere between four and a half thousand to ten thousand street kids most of them in gangs came with a young man who was a male prostitute for the men uh, and was being abused every day from when he was like four or five he was now coming into his early teens and a young lady who was the the, uh, the sex go-to for the gang members and even though the blood of Jesus had washed them and cleansed them through their prayer, their confession of faith, they still walked around with a tremendous amount of guilt. And even some of the most powerful psychiatrists and psychologists working with them found it to be a high mountain to cross. The, the, the ailment, the sickness of shame. Say, I refuse to carry shame. Please say that three times. Say that three times. In Numbers chapter number 12 and verse 1, the first family are having a bit of a family squabble. Anybody here with family that has family squabbles, raise your hands and your feet. <laughs> family squabbles do happen. They take place and they're not planned. And sometimes when we go to certain family functions, some of us are a little trepid because we know, especially if there's money involved, inheritance involved, there's always somebody that's a drinker, a squanderer, a druggy, da da da, lazy, hasn't worked, wah 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 wah, you know. And then a family squabble starts brewing up. And so uh, this family were key in the liberation struggle to get Israel set free. Miriam's the oldest, prayed for the family for 80 years. Uh, Aaron was the prophet, Exodus 7. He was the prophet. Moses was the deliverer, the apostolic deliverer who built the house. And God used him so mightily. And so all of his miracle ministry in Egypt and challenging Pharaoh, crossing the Red Sea, sweetening the waters of Marah, striking the rock in chapter 17 at Rephidim and bringing water out, all of those phenomenal, significant miracles uh, his wife, Jochebed, and his children, Gershon, and, um, did not witness the miracles. And so then Jethro, his father-in-law, comes and Moses tells them they hear the story the first time as their father slash grandfather of the wonderful things that God did in Egypt. And so Jethro hosted a, a, an evening, a dinner, a state dinner because he was head of state and priest of the Lord in the earth. And he blessed the family. Up until this point, there were no sacrifices outside of the single sacrifice of Passover in chapter 12 of Exodus. And it was here that Jethro confers blessings, the blessing of a statesman, the blessing of a father, and the blessing on their journey to the promised land. He confers that blessing. And along with Jethro, he brought Moses' wife. And the Bible is clear, says she was an Ethiopian woman, which meant that she was burnt-faced. She was a black woman. And so they were celebrating Moses' marriage all these years.
but there was no photograph, there was no painting, there was no WhatsApp pic, there was no selfie to see what the honey really looked like. And so when Jochebed showed up, they were like, what? <laughs> and so what was in them showed up. At some point in your life, unsolicited, unprepared, what's in you will show up. And that first response reveals who you really is. They were like, what? And then they took it a step higher. They used that occasion to up the ante and accuse Moses of making himself higher than they were, that they were also prophets. Well, he knew that because God had told him that they were prophets. Chapter 7 of Exodus, Aaron. Chapter 15 of Exodus, Miriam. And Moses was the prophet of God. So God called a meeting in chapter 12 of Numbers and runs through this deal. Here it is. Uh, I told the story. So let's go now to slide number 6 and pick up verse 12. With Moses I speak mouth to mouth. I will show him dark sayings. I will reveal to him great secrets. And uh, he says... I am ticked off that you guys were not afraid, you did not respect, uh, you had no constraint to speak to my servant Moses in the manner you did. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them. And when God departed, Moses cried to the Lord in verse 13 saying, Heal my sister now, O God, I beseech you, because God struck Miriam when the cloud lifted, Miriam had leprosy. And she had to be taken out the camp for seven days. And the Lord said to Moses, if I, if rather, if her father had heard what she said in the manner she said to you, he would have spit in her face and she should be ashamed. So what Almighty God did, he spat in Miriam's face. And the spit of God either creates or the Spirit of God creates the most uh, ferocious disease, incurable leprosy, where body parts fall off. And so this leprosy forced the triune team, caused a, an essential body part to fall off because of the despicable sickness of leprosy. And so God said she has to be out of the camp because there's one rule for everybody. It's not for your house and everybody's house. Because of a despicable behavior, she's been smitten with leprosy. She has to be out of the camp. And you'd better thank God that she's out of the camp for seven days and not the rest of her life. And Moses, the intercessor that he was, he prayed for her. And let her be shut out of the camp for seven days. And after that, let her be received again. And Miriam was shut out of the camp for seven days, and the people did not journey. The cloud did not move until Miriam was restored. And so God was kind in many ways to correct Miriam, who was a stateswoman, but she needed to be corrected. No matter how big you become in this church, I hate church politics. I hate politics. I hate jockeying over seats. I hate bad behavior for people trying to get parking using their rank. I hate all of that. I hate it. Amen. Just park far and walk. I hate the fact that, you know, when you have organizations where there's voting and so on, where there's fighting over positions and there's money involved, I hate all of that. And so God said, in the first family, there'll be no church politics. You are the first family. You must be an example because you are Levites and you've got others coming under you if you behave like that, you are going to release politics in the system that will destroy a holy priesthood. And secondly, I will be patient because of who Miriam is. I will slow down my agenda to journey. Miriam, you have cost us seven days of journeying time. Imagine losing a week in the stock exchange. Imagine losing a week if you put your money into <laughs> coins. <laughs> Enough said. 
And so say, God, you gracious unto me. And so Miriam had to be ashamed, and she was shamed. And God instructed Israel, when, uh, when Gogo Miriam walks through the camp, none of you point a finger at her, none of you scoff at her, none of you smirk and giggle, because what has been on Miriam will come on you. Do not dishonor her under any circumstance. Are we together, everybody? Say, God, remove all shame. Slide number eight. There are things that produce shame. There are many. I've just chosen a handful in lieu of the nature of this service and its time. Luke chapter 16, the general manager of a, an enterprise of a very rich man was abusing the money. He was borrowing and wanting to put it back. If you are responsible for someone's money, don't borrow and say you'll put it back. Ask and say, I need some help. Please, can I have $1,000, $2,000? I have an opportunity. It's better to ask and, and be approved or ask and say, not at this time. But for you to borrow and not put back the money, you're going to get yourself into a deep hole because you're developing a habit that's going to put you in jail at some point. And so this man then, because of his corruption, was fired. And so he says to himself, he says to himself, what shall I do? My Lord has fired me. I cannot dig. In other words, I left manual labor years ago. I started digging ditches, digging trenches, digging foundations, digging for econet that doesn't cover their troughs where they've made holes. I've dug there. And because of my work ethic, because of my discipline, I've been raised in the ranks to where I am, to become a general manager and possibly CEO. He said, before I was digging, before I had a job, I was begging. And he says here, to beg, I am ashamed. Because begging brings shame. Begging brings shame. If you have done so well all your life, and overnight, Bernie made off, made off with all your money. You lose your house, your assets, your name, your staff, and so on. And overnight, you on the street. All the guys you were giving drinks to and food for and hosting golf things and uh, holidays at Sun City and uh, Pumalanga and whatever, suddenly they don't want to know you. And now you're on the street. You're eating out of bins. And people are pointing at you and saying, ah, isn't that Chude Xe? This one used to be driving a, a certain car. Xe, look, ah, this one. Uh, we knew he was a crook, it said. Yeah. And so now it produces shame. Say after me, I refuse to be a beggar. Say that again. Don't beg anybody for anything. Don't beg your husband to spend time. Ask him, don't beg. Don't beg your wife to cook. Don't beg your wife to do whatever wives are supposed to do. Amen. Don't beg because begging produces shame. Amen. Begging produces shame. African leaders have been begging the West and now the Chicanese for decades, begging for roads, begging for dams, begging for power, begging, begging, begging. It produces shame. And what they do is when you are shamed, they then come in and take the rest of the little that you have which now concretizes shame indefinitely. I refuse to beg, and I refuse to be covered and shrouded in shame. Shout, I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed. Two more times. I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed. The Bible says, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Don't beg, ask. Don't beg, ask. A rich man was eating sumptuously and Lazarus was begging right there. He was begging. The rich man wouldn't share. If you are rich, share. If at the rich man's table, sweep outside. Wash his car. Don't kiss his feet and his ring. Clean the gates. Somebody, someone per chance will pass by and see you making an effort outside the stingy owner's house. 
and say, ah, this guy is at least making effort. This man that has three cars, five dogs, ten cats, and an elephant can't even feed this guy. Somebody passing by will see you. Ask every beggar that Jesus passed. He stopped and gave them life and life more abundantly. Esther say, I'm not begging. Amen. That's all the Esthers that said, I'm not begging. Say, I'm not begging. I'm not begging. King David's men were shamed. There was a certain battle, and in the battle, uh, they were separated through some sort of strategic maneuver. And the opposing soldiers uh, set a, a, a breach between uh, uh, the cavalry and the infantry and isolated a handful of men where they could not be resourced, and uh, they were surrounded and captured. And so instead of taking them as POWs, prisoners of war, they, they began to humiliate them. So what they did was they cut their clothes in half and revealed uh, their private organs. And that was shameful enough. But what was even more shameful, they cut their beards in half, which meant they made them half men. To reduce a man to half of what he was and what he is, is shameful. And so when they told King David, this is what they have done to your men, David refused to go and rescue them in their condition. He said, just send an emissary and tell them, stay out of the camp until you are clothed and covered and until your beard grows to the same length to what your beard was before half was shaved. In other words, being reduced to half the person you were produces shame. God and the system will give you time to grow back to what you were before you were shamed. In any way you were shamed, give yourself time to grow back to the status you were. Because if you are received in your condition, that shame will be perpetuated by kids and their generations saying, Uncle George, sorry George, Uncle George was shamed. And the story goes on and people make it worse than it was. But they remembered you going out as a man. When you come back, they see you coming back a stronger man. Knowing that you endured persecution. You endured abuse. You endured humiliation. And you become dubbed in daughter. I'm a daughter. You went through hell. You went through thick and thin. And you've come back with dignity. You've come back with your head held up high. You've come back proud, proud to be a soldier in David's army, proud to represent your nation, proud that you did not succumb to pressure. A man amongst men, not shamed. Shout, I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed. Ezra, the scribe, in the book of Ezra, chapter number eight, restored the Bible or the Torah. And he read the Torah to thousands of people in Jerusalem, a different story. And then it was needful for them to go out of the city and to uh, offer sacrifices to the Lord in thanksgiving. And so verse 21 of chapter 8, Then I, Ezra, proclaimed a fast there, which Pastor Zinashe has proclaimed from the second, that's tomorrow, all the way to the 22nd, it's a 21-day fast, one meal a day. A fast there at the river Ahava, that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek him in a right way for us and for our little ones and all of our substance, because God had given them so much. And then he says, I was ashamed to require of the king's soldiers and horsemen to help us, against the enemy in the way. There are certain requests that you must not be ashamed to ask. Do not be ashamed to make your request to the king. Whatever you want from God, especially on this day, don't be ashamed to ask. If you've been asking God to marry and you're not yet married, don't be ashamed and let the devil say, ah, but you, you're asking again, you should be shy. No. Has the devil married? He's never been married. Does the devil have children? He's never had children. So why is he shaming you? Shame him back. You are not going to hell. He's going to hell. Tell him, go to hell. Amen. So don't let the devil shame you for something he has not done. The devil's never been washed in the blood. You have been. 
The devil's never repented. He can never repent. The devil cannot sing praise and worship songs. He lost that eons ago. You can still praise and worship God. Amen. If you are unemployed, don't allow the devil to shame you. Ask God for a job. Ask him for a promotion. Satan will never be promoted. Satan's way is down. And even when he goes into hell, by Birinoti, it is a bottomless pit. He'll be sinking for the rest of his eternal existence. Shout, I'm not ashamed. Ask with boldness. Ask and proud to ask. Ask as a black woman. Ask as a black man. Ask as a husband. Ask in your unemployed condition. Ask as you are employed. Ask for a better car, a better house. Ask for water. Ask, listen. These people, you're dining, they eat pig feet. I'm not asking for pig feet. Amen. In here, man. Amen. Ask for tails, ox ones. Hallelujah. Someone shout, I'm asking. When you have an assignment from God, do not approach, do not be ashamed to approach the throne of grace. Come boldly to the throne of grace and approach the king as Queen Esther did. Approach the king without shame. Don't allow Haman to say, I'm going to squeal on you that you are a Jew. I'm going to squeal on you that you are an orphan. I'm going to squeal on you that you are an, an imposter. Uh, uh, don't, don't allow those kinds of sinister agendas and people to cause shame. Anoint your head after you fasted. Anoint your head. Get yourself some, uh, some Mac. What do you use, Chichi? Revlon. Esther Lauder. Get some spray. If you don't have spray, just pass by a public toilet and get some haze. Amen. Shua, 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 shua. And come before the king with boldness. Don't let them see you cry. Don't let them see you flinch. Don't let them see you in your weakness. God has called you for such a time as this. Amen. I said, God has called you for such a time as this. So lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, ye everlasting doors. The king is coming in. Don't be ashamed because you've been divorced. Don't blame yourself because of that. Don't be ashamed because your children don't want you to come and spend the holidays with you. Just lift up your head and be proud to be who you are. Thank God that he's called you to the kingdom, Stella, for such a time as this. If there's 10 people here that refuse to be ashamed, clap your hands. If there's 20 people here, stand up and give God praise and say, I refuse to be ashamed. Come on, someone. Psalm 74 and verse 20. Have respect to the covenant. For the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. Oh, do not let the oppressed return ashamed. Let the poor and the needy praise your name. Arise, O oh God. Plead your own cause. Remember how the foolish man reproaches you daily. He's saying here, don't let the oppressed be ashamed. If somebody has swaddled you on the head and sat on you all your life, do not be ashamed. God will hear the request of those that have been humiliated. Psalm 119 verse 6. Then I shall... Then... I shall not be ashamed. Say, I shall not be ashamed. Say, I shall not be ashamed. When I have respect to all your commandments, when you obey the word of the Lord, when you keep God's commandments, when you are covered by the shadow of God's word, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. Thy word is my direction, my guiding light and my compass. Because of your word that directs my life, I shall not be ashamed. Shout the word of God has lifted me. Shout love has lifted me. Shout grace 
has lifted me. Shout your loving kindness has lifted me. Shout your tender mercies have lifted me. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm not ashamed because God has taken time to lift me up. God has gone out of his way to bring me salvation. How sweet it is to have worship. How sweet it is to have communion. How sweet it is to talk with God and for him to talk with me. The songwriter said, I come to the garden alone. He walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, you'll only know it when God is fellowshipping with you. Shout no shame. Your word, O oh God, has removed me from shame. In the book of Joel, chapter number two, the floor shall be full of wheat, shout plenty. The vats are overflowing with wine and oil, shout plenty. I will restore to you the years, shout plenty. What the devourer has taken, God is given, shout plenty. What the canker worm, the petabola, and the palmer one has taken, shout plenty. You shall eat in plenty. Shout three times, I shall eat in plenty. Say that one more time with a lot of energy. And be satisfied three times. I will eat the word of God in plenty. I will eat the love of God in plenty. I will eat God's wisdom in plenty. I will eat the fellowship of God and the saints in plenty. I will eat my praise and worship in plenty. I will eat my food in peace and in plenty. I will eat my matumbo in plenty. I will eat my chicken feet in plenty. Can you hear what a brother's saying? And I will be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord our God and who has dealt wondrously with me and my people shall never be ashamed and my people shall never be ashamed and my people shall never be ashamed never be ashamed I won't give the devil any any pleasure to see me ashamed I won't give him pleasure to see me discouraged or weeping or crying I will never be ashamed I will never 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 be ashamed no shame in my life for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God under salvation the gospel has removed my shame Romans 5 and 3 hope makes not a shame I have hope for tomorrow I have hope for my future I have hope for my gift I have hope for my talent I have hope for my investment I have hope for my prayers I have hope for the blessing of God hope has brought me far. I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed. Shout, I'm not ashamed. Give God a praise. Romans 10 verse 11. For the scripture says, Whosoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe in the Father Almighty. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Bible. I believe in the universal church. I believe. I believe in prayers being answered. Shout, I am not ashamed. Shout, I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed of God. I am not ashamed of my salvation. I am not ashamed of my gospel. I'm not ashamed to carry my Bible in public. I'm not ashamed of my church. I'm a proud member of New Life Covenant Church 149, Robert Mugabe. 
I'm not ashamed to pray publicly. I'm not ashamed to fast. I'm not ashamed to pray in tongues. I'm not ashamed to be a man, a black man at that. I'm not ashamed to be a father, a grandfather at that. I'm not ashamed to be a Zimbabwean. I'm not ashamed to be an African. I'm not ashamed of my weakness because in weakness I am made strong. I am not ashamed of my family. I'm not ashamed of dream. I'm not ashamed of Terry. Never ashamed of Eden and Idris. I'm not ashamed of Jason. Never ashamed of Tadiwa. What can I say of Amelia? Not ashamed of TJ Lashan and all the buns in that oven. I'm not ashamed of my mother-in-law with her dark classes in a bright room. I'm not ashamed of my leadership. I'm not ashamed of the worshipers. I'm not ashamed of the band. I'm not ashamed of the praise and worship. I'm not ashamed of my destiny. I'm not ashamed of my friends. Give God a praise. I'm not ashamed to praise him publicly. I'm not ashamed to dance before the Lord. I'm not ashamed to clap my hands. I'm not ashamed to prophesy. I'm not ashamed to give my offerings. I'm not ashamed to be a tithe payer. I'm not ashamed to rejoice in the Lord. Give God a praise because I'm not ashamed. <laughs>